Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and this is Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. Matt Wallace's Savage Rebellion trilogy is a compelling, layered fantasy epic by equal turns brutal and bleak war story, twisty political intrigue, and morally gray coming-of-age tale. The expansionist Empire of Kresh purports itself as a kind of nobility-eschewing utopia. But the nation sustains its endless growth through constant conflict, conscripting its lowest citizens, criminals, and other unfortunates into a secret army called the Savage Legion. The strategy? Throw a nearly endless wall of these desperate savages against any enemy, eroding their defenses through sheer numbers before Kreish's true military might smashes through the remainders. The Legion not only crushes adversaries and keeps the walled city streets clear of undesirables, though, it's also a convenient vehicle for the disappearance of political adversaries and other dissidents. But when a duplicitous and violently capable woman infiltrates the Legion in search of one such missing figure, her quest will inadvertently spark a rebellion, pitting the savages against their own nation. As war escalates beyond, within the walled capital, a bereaved low-level politician's pursuit of truth tangles her in the machinations of clandestine powers. And in a remote island fortress, a disabled street urchin is given the chance to serve the nation's inventive and secretive planning cadre. Her brilliant mind wins mentorship from the cadre's leader, but the secrets she learns will lead to upheaval just as powerful as those of the distant rebellion. This gripping fantasy series begins with Savage Legion, continues with Savage Bounty, and concludes with Savage Crowns, all available now from Saga Press. And Matt Wallace, welcome to Fictitious. Thank you so much. Can I just please, I have to tell you, that is my favorite summary I've ever heard in my life. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank I you. Want, I want to hire you as like, like my herald, like Paul Bettany in A Knight's Tale, just go with me to all my events and describe my books to people that was just stunning. i could live my best bard life right exactly give me some nice heraldry and a <laughs> trumpet or you know what i'm a guitar player give me a lute i can do the whole oh thing. my god that just took it to a whole nother a whole nother level no i was already going to tell you before we started you have maybe the best podcaster voice i've ever heard <laughs> in 15 years of doing podcasting and then you laid that amazing summary on top of it that just like made my whole year, man. Thank you so much for that. Well, I'm going to have a hard time living up to that through the rest of this interview, but I do <laughs> thank you for all of that. As we get started here, it should be noted, this is like Fictitious's first episode in like two years. You know, I've been on Hideous for a long time. I had a big backlog of shows before. And when I was trying to figure out who I wanted to talk to first, when I wanted to come back, you were way up on that list. And the reason for it is because during that time period, I fell into like a real reading slump. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of different reasons, for a little bit, I just got really disconnected from everything. And there were two th book series that helped me break that slump. One of them was that I decided to go back to something I'd already knew and loved, which was Martha Wells' Murderbot series. And yeah. I had read the first four, not the, not the last two of it. And so I was like, I just blew through that whole series because Murderbot is fantastic. And mm -hmm. then right around while I was reading that, I saw you tweet something about how the first two books in the series were on sale. You're one of these authors that like that I've known as a as a social media presence for a long time, right. but I had not yet read you. You were one of those people that like lots of authors I talked to. They talked about your stuff. They talked about you. And I always really liked your commentary online. And also, not for nothing, I can't think of you as anything other than Matt F. and Wallace because of your <laughs> name you know, on Christ. Twitter and Instagram. So I saw your tweet saying, hey, you know, the first two books in Savage Belt Rebellion are on sale. And I was just like, bam, done bottom and then they were the next thing i read after Murderbot, and you know i carried straight through those first two novels and between martha and your work it finally broke that slump for me where i got excited uh -huh. about fiction again and i really you know and it was really fun back to back very very different kinds of books but both with oh, incredible yeah. world building and interesting characters and so yeah so you were right at the top of the list when you know i got the notice that you were out promoting the third book i was like bam let's do this we're back in the game dude that, that's so amazing man thank you i first of all it's just amazing company to be in martha wells is like top of the top of the heat for me so i i'm really i'm happy martha and i could help you out then yeah. that way. <laughs> <laughs> when you, you need to break a slump you go to the best in the business right that's just good strategy <laughs> in these things so i gave my big lengthy spiel at the top there again wearing my heldry and doing my best bard life when you go out and sell this book when you talk about it to people what is your author pitch how do you tell people about this trilogy in in no way will it be as splendid as, as what you just said there but i <laughs> you know i try to you want to you want to boil it down to sort of the elevator pitch and uh i don't even think i came up with this i think i copped this from uh whatever whatever problem i've had so many publicists through the life of the series but one of them described it as uh you know several characters within a seemingly utopian society 
uncovering its dark underbelly. And I always like the dark underbelly part, but that's basically what it's about. It's about the idea of this self-aware fantasy medievalish society that uh, sort of has learned the mistakes of a lot of other fantasy novels. And has, you know, they built this world trying to avoid that, but because they're still people, it all eventually goes off the rails. So it seems awesome on top. It seems like the society you would build if you could learn from other epic fantasy novels. But uh, there's this dark underbelly to it and these different characters that we follow through their, their point of views in very different parts of the society all sort of start unraveling it from within. There's a lot I want to dig into about that as we talk about the world building of this, particularly because this nation's representative symbology uses ants. And I don't really think that I've seen anybody do that before, but I'm going to get to that. The first thing I want to kind of talk about, though, is just because, especially in marketing a book anymore, like genre and subgenre is so important. Um, you know, it helps people find the things they're into or, you know, helps them kind of categorize them for it. This is a fantasy novel, but it doesn't necessarily have all the trappings of fantasy. Like they're, you know, we don't have magic users throwing fireballs right, and right. dragons flying through the air and all that kinds of things. So where would you categorize this? Like um, what kind of subgenre of fantasy do you think this fits into? I mean, we've been instilling it under the umbrella of epic fantasy. And I think that that's apropos because that's really what I set out to do. I mean, my my idea of epic fantasy, it's definitely, it's funny you talk about that because like the whole thing I wanted to do with the series was write my take on a big sprawling epic fantasy with the ones I grew up reading, like Pern and Dragonlance and all of those things. And then somewhere along the way, I made the decision to strip all of those types of elements out and just do this completely different <laughs> thing where like the only real real connector is that it's a it's a vaguely medievalish society but it's in a completely you know secondary world made up setting so yeah no but i'm i'm fine with the label of epic fantasy i find i find you know the thing that bothers me is those labels are really only useful for marketing and i just I, high fantasy low fantasy epic fantasy it just it's all kind of bs to me at the end of the day it's it's a fantasy novel it's a big sprawling big in scope fantasy novel and that's so we we call it epic fantasy and i'm, I'm okay with that I mean, that totally works for me. And I agree. Like when we get into all those things, I mean, it's really about trying to find audience and find things that people connect yeah. to. Uh, you know, the weird thing for me is that uh, not only as a you know reader who does a show like this, but also just as a reader who loves lots and lots of different kinds of things. I'm not one of those people that locks in on like, I just read urban fantasy or I just right. read this, you know, and there are readers like that. And I mean, and that's perfectly fine. Whatever works, you know, do you boo. But <laughs> uh, to me, it's kind of baffling. I don't like to stay in a lane. I want to jump back and forth on things. So most of the time, I don't really pay that much attention to it. But it is something that, you know, from a standpoint of pushing it out into the world and getting people to notice it is sometimes useful. You talked about the fact, though, that this kind of started with you thinking of you mentioned Dragonlance and, and Pern, you know, some of those mm -hmm. great things of like, I think of them as the 90s because that's when I read them, but it oh, yeah. probably started sooner. Thinking about that, you know, what's the origin story of this? Because honestly, there's almost like kind of three different stories going on, at least when you talk about the first book, you know, it's almost like three separate stories happening simultaneously. Any of them could stand on their own as like one individual narrative. So where did this book series start for you? At what point did you kind of get the ideas put together and i don't need to do the like where do your ideas come from no because... no no i i totally get it it's very interesting you mentioned that because i the the first book in particular savage legion i have a hard time with long form fiction i don't i'm not a long form writer naturally i really started out writing more short stories which is hilarious because i haven't written a new short story in years now at this point with everything else i do so the idea of tackling a book because savage legion is the longest book i've written it's the longest book in the series it's the longest thing i've ever done by quite a quite a wide margin and to break it down for myself I kind of ended up having to approach it because right before that I had done a series of novellas called uh, Cinde Jour. There were seven books in that series and they were all novellas they were all short books. I kind of ended up breaking Savage Legion down into three novellas that were told from the perspective of the three different main characters and then at the end sort of interweaving them all together to just sort of fake an epic fantasy novel out of three novellas I tend, I could, <laughs> I tend to think of it as really. And that was how I was able to kind of both get my head around it uh, mentally and then also just logistically, physically, emotionally tackle it and actually finish the damn thing because it took me years. You know, it's the longest I've ever spent working on anything. Uh, so it's very interesting to hear you talk to the way you broke it down this because it's very accurate. It is three stories. And I do hope that when you read the first book, I did an OK job of weaving them all together. So it works as one one big work. But that's definitely how I approached it. Um, in terms of the origin, you know, as I mentioned before, one of the big motivating factors was I wanted to write my take on those big sprawling fantasy series I grew up with. I always wanted to do that. My thing was I didn't want to do it just to do it. I had to have the right idea. It had to be the right vehicle to kind of motivate me to go, okay, that's that's the idea. That's my epic fantasy idea. 
And I kind of came to that when I was reading about um, the history of uh, conscripted soldiers. I just found that very compelling. It was whether it was Turkic slave soldiers or the French Revolutionary War or just that's just such a brutal tool of empire. And the thing is, that was sort of what got me into the idea of deconstructing empire, which is really ultimately what the whole thing is about. But it started for me with that idea of conscripts. And that's just a very particular. I'm a big found family guy, too. All my stories tend to be about found family because, you know, I was raised by a single mother and just, you know, that whole thing. But that kind of struck me as like, well, that's a very specific kind of found family story to tell because you're thrust against your will into this very brutal environment. And you sort of have to figure the system out and find your people within it to survive. That's what it's all about. So that's where it started with me. And, it, and originally the story was just going to be about that. It was just going to be about the Savage Legion. It was going to be told solely from Evie, who is the character you referenced in your amazing intro, who, uh, who enters the Savage Legion to, to find somebody. It was solely going to be about her perspective and that the, the story, the world, you were never really going to see the outside of it. It was going to be the idea that there's this huge world in the background, but we only see it from this one perspective. And I started doing that. I actually kind of wrote a rough draft of that a long time ago. And it just wasn't, it's not even that it wasn't working. It just wasn't what I wanted it to be. I kind of felt like I was shortchanging the world and the idea of that doing that sprawling story. And then I was watching the HBO series, The Wire, um, which is, you know, Davis, it's a brilliant, brilliant show uh, for those who haven't seen it. And I was watching that and I realized like, that was the kind of structure I wanted to tell an epic fantasy story through. And I, I love the way The Wire is about a system and about a society it's really the story of that system and of society and how broken it is. And it's and, and you explore that through all of these different seemingly unrelated characters from all of these different walks of life, whether it's, you know, the drug dealers, the cops, the politicians, the reporters and journalism, you know, school kids. I love that. And I thought I could, I could really take that and bring it to this, this kind of the foundation I'd laid with the Savage Legion thing and then build a bigger world and a build a bigger story on top of it. And that's when I started adding all of the other perspectives. And that's really when it started to click. And when I started to sort of find what the story and what the world was going to be. I like that you make the comparison with The Wire there, um, because something that struck me very early on in the series is that it reminded me of of long form television construction, that I thought a lot about how, you know, there are series. And I, I mean, I hate to I'm not comparing that, like you know, using right. like Game of Thrones as an example course, or something yeah. where there are several very distinct locales um, in that story. And granted, it kind of starts in one place and then separates, whereas yours starts in a bunch of different places and then funnels uh mm. but for me it felt very similar to that sense of like you know you were building moments here and then you transition to someplace else and kind of let other things happen what you would maybe think of as the boring bits happen behind right. the scenes <laughs> and right. then come back to them when the interesting stuff is happening again right let the people you know eat dinner and go to the bathroom off screen and then come back around once you've seen what's going on in other places but this one struck me as having a, a fairly particularly tricky setup in order for you on the back end to keep track of all of it, because there are these, at least initially, kind of three major POVs, and they are happening in three very distinct different places and having very different kinds of tales, you know, the things I talked about. And there are more POVs than that, and we'll get to them. But right. so one thing I was kind of wondering about it is like, one, each one of those is, you mentioned found family, and that definitely runs through them um, right. as, a, as a theme and a trope. But they're all dissecting political structure in very different ways, in very different mm -hmm. angles, but they're also on a shared timeline while not touching each other directly. How do you manage that? Like on the back end of writing, you mentioned that you sort of wrote Evie's story as kind of a standalone to begin right. with and then had to figure out how these like almost like the two other vertical stories are kind of paralleling it and then have to wind together. So how do you keep track of that back and forth? That was not easy. <laughs> That's the short <laughs> answer. Well, you know, like I said before, when I, I the way I broke it down, tell, kind of telling their stories individually, all of what you're talking about there, the really difficult stuff, um, I, that happened in the editing. Literally, like I had to take these three different chunks and then weave them together. And when I did that, that's when, and the thing was, I told myself, if I'm ever going to finish this, that's what I need to do. I'm going to write Evie's story. I'm going to write Diawan's story. I'm going to write uh, Lexi's story. And then I'll get to the end and I'll see how it all works together. And I just wasn't going to worry so much as I went along about the timelines matching up and the events matching up and, and all of that, you know, because I, I had, and I'm not, I'm not a big outliner to begin with. I don't like to be locked in to a really rigorous outline. I like 
I hate to use the word organic, but I just like things to kind of grow on their own. I like, I like to be able to free form as I go. I'll have the big beats in mind, but then I just, I just like to, you know, do jazz hands in the middle. Um, <laughs> spirit so, fingers. Exactly. Jazz hands, spirit <laughs> fingers. That's what it's all. It's all about the razzle dazzle. But no, so when I got, so when I had their stories roughed out in that first form, then I went back and actually read them and went, okay, how do I need to structure this so that they're running parallel Everything's making sense with everything else. Everything thematically is jiving with everything else. That was probably a year long process uh, in itself. And I don't, I actually don't recommend doing this if you're going to write a novel this way. <laughs> it's just what, and the thing is, I didn't do this for the other two books. It's just, I was in a place where I told myself, if you're ever actually going to finish a first draft of this, I think this is what I need to do. And it, and it worked. It worked for me. It just took a very long time. But yeah, that was. You know, it was a lot of notebooks. It was a lot of post-its. It was a lot of multiple screens and having each story on a different screen and then literally constructing a timeline and then literally just writing, putting all the chapters up and figuring out which one needed to go before that. And this can come over here. Oh, but then we're too AV heavy perspective here for these three chapters. So I need to break that up. So I think I need to write a bridge piece here. It was a lot of that in the editing. And that's really where the book kind of became the book. And then the other piece of that was that was just to get my first draft when Nava Wolf, my my fantastic editor for Savage Legion, multiple Hugo Award winning editor, Nava Wolf, very proud of her. When she bought the series and we started working on the first book, she tore what I had done completely apart and we pretty much rebuilt it from scratch from that. And she <laughs> she helped me make that book a million times better than I think it would have been with me left to my own devices. So I have to give her a lot of credit for the things you're talking about too, because she was she was the one who went, okay, this doesn't make sense. This is really well-defined, this part of the world, but this other part of the world, you're really kind of left too sketch. We need to fill that out. She really filled in all the blanks that I still had after I did my pass on it. Nava Wolf is a rock star. And I remember when she exited Saga, that that was kind of a, a shakeup in the world of publishing. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to put a pin in that. And we'll come back to that because I want to talk more sure. about editorial, that impact and that journey, because all of that, I think, is really important to this tale. And just to anybody who is interested in, in you know, the crafting of story and how traditional publishing works. But I want to swing back around into the major part of the story here, because I want to make sure that as our listeners are kind of exploring this and kind of getting a, a, a real handle on what's happening here. Because I, I got the vision of like what I was thinking of as the murder board, um, <laughs> you know what I'm talking like the, the classic people will know the Charlie Day kind of like meme image oh, of yeah, him standing yeah, in front yeah. of the thing because pre piecing that kind of narrative together is obviously a labor of love, but also you know, emphasis on the labor because there's mm. a lot of work to make that come together. Let's tighten up around a couple of the core concepts sure. and then we'll kind of move along here. You give a really great explanation of the, what the Savage Legion is and kind of your historical influences and stuff for it. So let's talk about Evie and why she ends up in the Savage Legion. Because when we're initially in the first book introduced to her, at first it, she looks like somebody who's just been basically grabbed off the street um, mm -hmm. because she's started a brawl, seems like a near do well, and then, you know, gets pulled into this thing. But we very quickly come to understand that that is an intentional series of events. So can you talk about kind of the motivation for her character? It, obviously, we don't want to spoil things right, heavily right, right. for an audience coming in, but I think the first half of the first book is game, you know, as, as no, a no, trilogy. Sure, <laughs> absolutely. No, no, I, um, one of the things I, I just kind of wanted to do with the first book, just because I, I enjoy things like that, is nobody, nobody's really who you, who they seem to be when you're introduced to them, even all the main characters. Uh, some more duplicitous than the others, but others are just, they haven't grown into the people they're going to be yet. So it was very important to me to just kind of start with this baseline of, you think you've got a handle on this world and who these people are and what they're doing. And then eventually all of that is going to get flipped on its head as their arcs go along. And I did that not because I'm trying to trick anybody or be clever, but I just enjoy stories like that. I like being surprised like that. I like realizing that, oh, I thought I had this character pegged, but I didn't at all. But if you go back and look, it kind of makes sense how they end up like this. Like I like that experience as a reader and everything I'm trying to do as a writer is really just to make people feel the things I feel when I read a story I really like. So that was just part of that. But yeah, with Evie in particular, she starts out, you think she's, like you said, you think she's just a drunk and a, and a vagrant and just somebody who's starting bar fights. She gets thrown in a dungeon and then she ends up getting tossed into the, into the meat grinder with all these conscripts. But what you come to realize is, yeah, she's done this intentionally. She's looking for a specific person who has been conscripted into the Savage Legion. And it's, uh, like you mentioned in your intro, it's actually one of the more like dissident people that we talked about, the way they're using the Savage Legion to sort of make people who question the system disappear. And she has, you know, both a personal motivation for that 
And then another motivation uh, for that, that, you know, that's what sort of drew her into doing this uh, to begin with. So she starts off, that's, she has a mission. She's a, she's a woman. She's her back, her background is she's a bodyguard. That was what she did in this, in this very polite society of a uh, Kresh, which is interesting. I put that in there because I'd read a really interesting article about China and about how um, aristocratic families in China left will often hire unassuming seeming women to be bodyguards for their children because they don't want to send their kids to school with these big hulking intimidating bodyguards mm. so they'll they'll hire trained soldiers and martial artists and you know wushu practitioners but people who seem you know like slight unassuming women because it's less ostentation as, an, as, as a presentation i found that really interesting that's actually where the idea for a character came from. yeah that's, that's fascinating just, i like that. that's just an aside but i just always found that really interesting so she's been performing that but that actually feeds into what we're talking about because that's been that's sort of become her function in society she serves that function for one of the the families that that employs her so She's not a soldier. She has combat training, but it's very, you know, it's very like the near surface level. She hasn't actually had to employ it. So when she gets thrown into the situation, she's capable. She's, has a, she's had the training, but it's a completely new reality for her, which is melee fighting on a battlefield in this open warfare uh, setting. And she has to navigate all that to complete her mission. But yeah, so she starts off as a woman with a very singular mission. But as she goes on, she starts to, and she, you know, whether she accomplishes the mission or not, I don't want to go into that. But like, she realizes that, Everything that's happening, the nature of the Savage Legion, who these people are, how they've been conscripted, what they're being used for, and the broader implications of that on a societal level is something that needs to be addressed. And, you know, like like any great rebellion story, I think it starts off with people realizing something is wrong, not really knowing what to do about it. But then through circumstances and, and their own choices, they end up sort of assuming a role of a rebel and, and fighting against it. And that's what happens to Evie. She's, she's a woman who starts out with a very simple mission, get in, find someone, get out. And then she gets drawn in to the whole story of the Savage Legion. She starts to care about her fellow legionnaires and, uh, you know, ends up sort of starting a rebellion, as you do sometimes. <laughs> A theme that I always find myself very attached to is unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. When people get involved in a story for, you know, whether it's good intentions or it's, you know, a very specific mission or something like that. And the way the dominoes fall afterwards and how it leads them down different paths and, you know, big, big you know, results from things that they would have never mm -hmm. seen coming. With Evie, you know, it's leading to this rebellion, which is you know, obviously the title of the whole series. Right. Uh, but, you know, in Lexi's case, it's sort of inadvertently sort of becoming a pawn of bigger political figures that are working within this society. And so things like that, I'm, I'm always really into. And I, I like how those things kind of, you know, where the chips fall on this one. Going back to Kreish for a second, you know, we've talked about the Savage Legion and we've talked about a little bit that it's, there's this kind of utopian-esque element to it. One of the things I thought was really interesting about the way you constructed this nation, and I refer to it as expansionist because they're, mm -hmm. they're really like a, a machine that is endlessly gobbling up the space around them. And I mentioned that their symbology is the ant, um, which works on a lot of metaphorical <laughs> levels for them. But one thing that really, really grabbed me was the sense that this is a nation that rejects nobility, mm -hmm. that in the past they had had nobles and they said, no, the hell with that. We're going to get rid of all of that and we're going to create this completely different political structure in order to create this this nice and polite society where we have pleaders who you know stand up for the people on the lower end of things and, and you know, a very orderly kind of society. What more can you kind of tell me about Kreish, like how that came together and what challenges are there in building something like that in the story, but also what advantages it kind of gives you as far as building your narrative and the kind of adventure it allows you to establish? I mean, one of the things I absolutely loathe about epic fantasies uh, like this, and one of my least favorite tropes in the general, is that idea that nobility, blood nobility is inescapable. And I, yeah. I dislike how a lot of authors sort of lean on the idea that, well, it has to be like this because that's the way it was in real life. Like, I hate that excuse. It's a, made yes. up, it's a completely made up fantasy world. You can do whatever the hell you want. Right. And I'm not going to start throwing out names or throwing shade or whatever, but you just read a lot. <laughs> you read a lot of books genuinely by a very specific type of dude and you just kind of feel like they're sort of fetishizing that idea of blood nobility a little bit. Oh, yeah, you, for sure. Yeah. And I start to get a little disturbed when I when I get in. You sort of feel like without really signing up for it, you find yourself in the middle of some guy's power trip fantasy. And I just don't 
I, I don't I don't get with that, man. It just and it just ends up getting really brutal. And that's something I just wanted to eschew immediately when I started doing this. Like I don't want to do that. And so the idea was start with that. Start with the idea that, that that did exist in this world. Like there were blood nobles. They did the stereotypical medieval fantasy thing. They did the Game of Thrones thing. And then along the way, someone went, This is really useless and dumb. Like, why are we doing this? Like, why are we letting people who were extracted from the right crotch run things? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So they overthrow that system. And then the idea is, okay, well, what do you, you successfully do that? What do you replace that uh, with? Um, you know, do you go with a straight democracy? Like, what's the thing? I started to sort of see as in this idea of more of a communal system. The idea that's like, okay, we have all these resources. We have all these things we need to do. We have all these jobs in the task. So what if we just let anybody that wants to get a group together, they can manage one of these things. And that'll sort of be their job. Uh, Phil and Susie and their group over there, they got a bunch of people together. They can handle the cisterns and the sewage and stuff. And then, you know, these guys will harvest this. And it sort of becomes that like idea of, okay, if we're just a community of people, we're all doing our task, we all share with each other, then everything's going to be cool, right? Like it's, that's, there's no problem. We can just do that. And in my head, you know, and when we come to the story, this has been going on for hundreds of years at this point. Like it's a very solidified thing. But in my head, the, the idea was, okay, man, that did work for a while, but inevitably... It, there's still people there's still somebody right. still has to run things and make decisions those people are gonna like they're gonna go on their own kind of power trip so over time you start to build this thing of like all right well it started with simple groups of people but now we're hundreds of years in so those simple groups have become the new form of legacy they become the new powerful families you know it's not necessarily about blood nobility anymore but once people get a hook into something and they taste a little bit of power they're not going to give it up you know, they're going to become very insular. So that very well-intended communal system has become this massive bureaucracy of oppression just by benefit of it's run by people. And another thing that I really liked about the idea was, you know, the sort of the idea of the people behind the scenes. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little more later, but just them realizing that you don't need monarchs. You don't need a big public face. And matter of fact, it's better if you don't have one. It's better if the people can't point to a guy and say, I'm miserable because of that guy. You don't want that. So if you create this big bureaucracy, this big nameless, no faces, no frills, no stories, no legends, none of that stuff, you take away people's myths and you don't give them anything new to work with, then they just, you know, you sort of become the, and that's where the ant thing came from. You just become sort of a worker during the system and you don't even know who to complain to at that point bureaucracy to me becomes the ultimate shade and the ultimate protection because it's no one's fault at that point. You know, no one's, you can't point to anyone and go, no, it's their fault. They made these decisions. It's just the bureaucracy. So you just kind of go, the people just end up sort of going along with it. And I really find something very relevant about that, especially in terms of where we are today. So that's in a loose term. And I don't know if that fully answered the question, but that's really how the idea of creation in my head evolved. And that was really my thinking behind the point that we get to now when we come into the story. I like the idea of bureaucracy as armor, essentially, mm -hmm. because, I mean, if you've ever had to deal with City Hall for like yeah. something small, you will get bounced from person to person to person. And there's always a pass the buck. And it's always this nebulous idea of who handles something. And then maybe you find a superhero in a back corner somewhere who can change the filing system <laughs> to fix something for you. It's very different from, you know, figurehead based uh, yeah. the political stuff um, where the buck stops at that desk, you know, instead the buck never stops. It just keeps no. passing. And that's and the thing is, that's completely to me, that's always that's intentionally built in the system. The red tape is there to be exactly that. One of the places this came from, actually, this is, this is I was going to say this is dumb. It's actually kind of perfect. Uh, my wife and I were trying to cancel our cable subscription <laughs> and you're on the phone for an hour and a half. You're getting passed around from department to department. There's no simple way to do it. And they do that so that eventually 90% of people will just give up. Right. If they make it difficult enough to get to someone who can give you an answer, most people will just give up. So if you expand that to a societal level, which honestly kind of already exists and, and in many forms of government, I 100% feel it's intentional, it's malicious, and it's designed to make people just give up and go with it because it's too inconvenient to do anything about it. And that's so, yeah, that's completely the, the idea of creation. That sums it up in a nutshell on that level. 
in web design and like user experience design, they call that dark patterns. Right. The things that are designed to keep you from accomplishing <laughs> the thing that you want to do. You'll give up before you return the item back to the online source that you bought mm -hmm. it or whatever those things are because you can't cancel the subscription because it's three pages deep of stuff you can't understand. It's always intentional. It is a thing that's designed to make you just grind to a halt. And on that level of scale, the effectiveness, we see it in our own you know, culture and world. Mm -hmm. and, and here Absolutely. it works very, very well. There's another entity in this world that's kind of behind some of these things. Right. And the narrative sits kind of separate with it. And we'll talk a lot about Slider here in a minute. But first, I want to talk about what the planning cadre is. What is this other entity that sits separate but completely interwoven in the machine that is this nation? No, absolutely. And this isn't really a spoiler because you kind of figure this out pretty quickly. But yeah, the planning cadre... Uh, they, what you come to find out very soon is that they are the power behind Kresh and no one knows they exist. No one has any idea. It's not an official body. It's not part of the capital. It's set away on its own little private island. And it's just this citadel of very simple seeming people in these little robes who call themselves planners. They seem to be just that. They seem to be civic planners. You know, they come up with ideas for the city, for transportation, for waste. And there's a character, Slider, who you mentioned, who ends up uh, coming to the planning cadre sort of as a servant to just sort of clean things and deliver messages. And what Slider quickly realizes is that they're not just a group of civic planners. These are the people who actually run this entire nameless bureaucracy of Kresh. Everything springs from this tiny little citadel on this tiny little island and this tiny group of, uh, of old men and women who uh, come up with all the ideas and figure everything out. And they've also figured out how to keep a, a you know a whole kingdom sized nation subdued while they wage this endless war far away to keep feeding the small tiny concentration of resources there's something that made me feel almost like x files -y in there which mm. is that if x files taught us anything is that real power doesn't draw attention to itself exactly. it sits in the shadows and manipulates things and is comfortable in the quietness you know of nobody noticing they're there so that they can really accomplish things without the interference of awareness and fame or publicity mm -hmm. or notoriety and the planning cadre really kind of has that going for them so that makes me want to talk about Daiwan and you know this character also called slider um mm -hmm. and she's got a very specific name for it and, and i want to sort of pair the discussion of her with another character here in a minute is i'm gonna say it wrong is it taru Taru, yeah, you got um, it. So we'll, we'll pair that discussion with another character named, named Taru for a couple of different reasons here. But um, what can you tell us about Slider? Like, how does this character get this name? How does she show up in the planning cadre at this, you know, isolated island? What's her part to play in all of this? No, absolutely. She's one of my favorite. Uh, I mean, I love all the characters, but she's one of my favorites. No, Slider, she starts off as basically your classic fantasy street urchin. Um, she's lost. She's disabled. She's lost the use of her legs in a, in a cart accident. And she's learned to literally slide herself around on a sheet of greased uh, tin. And that's how she's navigated the streets of Kresh in one of the worst parts of the city. She gets snapped up at the same time Evie does at the beginning of the story, put in the dungeons, and they both get taken. But the thing is, they don't conscript the disabled into the Savage Legion. So while Evie is conscripted to the Savage Legion, the slider or die when she finds herself taken to the planning cadre, sort of waking up there after disappearing from this dungeon and meeting who she comes to find out is the head of the entire thing, uh, this guy, Edger, who basically gives her a job uh, working in the planning cadre. You know, you need planning cadres like any other place. You need cooks. You need people to clean stuff. You need people to deliver messages between departments because it's basically, one, again, it's one big bureaucracy. And Slider finds that she's going to fulfill that role. She doesn't know why she was plucked to do it. And what she comes to realize is that Edger himself uh, also has a disability. He has a facial paralysis that prevents him from emoting or expressing or even talking. He talks with, a, with an accessibility aid. It's actually a dr little dragon attached to his neck. And what Daiwan sort of comes to understand is that Edger has a penchant for disabled people. There are a lot of other disabled workers in the planning cadre citadel who perform seemingly menial tasks. Um, that seems to make sense to her at first. She's like, okay, well, you know, Edger has a thing for people like me, and I, I guess I should just count myself lucky, and I'll just do my little task. And But what we come to understand about Daiwan is that she's actually very brilliant. She's, very, she's got a very natural intelligence about her. It's one of the ways she's been able to survive so long on the street as a very slight disabled girl. And before long, Edger and the other planners start to notice that as well. Not only is she very smart, she's actually a genius. She just hasn't been given the resources, the access to exploit that. 
So they start exploiting that and she starts to, you know, elevate herself beyond her simple station. And as that happens, she starts to figure out what Evie's figuring out at the same time in the in the Savage Legion, which is everything is really screwed. And <laughs> what's going what's going on is not cool. And there are other things that, you know, again, I don't want to get into too heavy spoilers, but there are other things she finds out. But that's that's basically how her arc begins and her and her foundation is from this idea of this that classic kind of uh, street urchin and fantasy. But my my thinking was, well, what if one of those people, and again, this is very reflective of real life one of those disadvantaged people was actually given the access and the resources and the advantages that so many others are given. What could they do? And that's really where that character sort of comes from. There's something that I really like seeing in Slider's narrative, and it's that idea that you can have somebody who doesn't necessarily come off as a genius because, you know, she's basically starting life at mm -hmm. the very bottom of the heap. You know, she loses the use of her legs very early on. Mm -hmm. But like you said, I mean, she's very smart. She's streetwise. She's surviving in a world that would absolutely chew her up and yet is still functional in it, you know, even as, as a young, mostly defenseless girl mm -hmm. uh, in a rough place. But being given access to education, to mm -hmm. you know, reading materials, to other minds, because the, she encounters other people in this place that are eager to speak and to share knowledge and that get excited about meeting somebody else who's intelligent and very quickly blossoms into the person that she is. And I, I really like that because, you know, we see so often in the real world that there are people who have much greater potential than they live up to because they're never given a chance to have that potential nurtured. And that there are probably a lot of real geniuses out there that we don't know are geniuses because they're stuck in a grind that doesn't allow them to move beyond that. So I like that that element of the story a lot. And she's definitely one of my two favorite characters from the series. The other one is Taru. And Taru is what the society refers to as undeclared. Yeah. Can you kind of extrapolate on what that is, what it means to be undeclared and what Taru's role is? Because I feel like this character really becomes kind of a connective tissue as the story goes along um, because their narrative kind of stretches across a couple of these different storylines and starts bringing things together. No, yeah, it's Haru, again, one of my favorite characters as well. So Undeclared is essentially Kreisha's version of non-binary. That's, that's what that is. And it's based on a, a friend I have who was born uh, multi-sex. And the idea that the society forces you to choose, are you going to be a man or are you going to be a woman under those circumstances? And Undeclared is someone who didn't feel comfortable doing that, didn't want to make that decision, didn't feel like they fit into either of those labels and they openly chose to simply be who they were. And undeclared is the label they have imposed on them by the society for that. It's not a well-received label in most of the society. You know, it's a di it, uh, being undeclared is a difficult thing to be in Krish. It's one of those subtle forms of discrimination that's, you know, it's not legislated. It's not something that's open. Undeclared people have the rights that anyone else in Croatia has, but it's one of those societal things that there's, there's a lot of undeclared oppression against them. Taru is a retainer. They're a bodyguard for one of those communal, you know, things that started as communal factions uh, and that became, you know, this, what they call gens or just, you know, a group of people who do a service specific task. Taru serves a gen uh, of pleaders, which are essentially lawyers or attorneys. They're public defenders. And the gen that Taru serves is not a particularly esteemed or powerful gen. They plead for a section of the capital city that's called the Bottoms, which is where all the poor and the downtrodden are sort of herded and isolated. And they try to get resources for them, often, you know, to no avail. Um, but yeah, Taru uh, really started as a secondary character. But as the series goes on, yeah, Taru, they, they really, they become a lot more. And I didn't actually originally intend that, but they do exactly, like you said, they sort of became my connective tissue for all, for all the stories. And as, and as the three main characters we start off with, sort of move around and, you know, they have their own arcs and whatever happens to them. Taru's the one who sort of takes more of a center stage role, driving a, a very important part of the, the plot and the story forward. And then their arc as well also got a lot bigger than I intended it to. But they're, they're one of my favorite characters as well. I always like when a side character steals the show. Yeah. You know, I mean, we see it happen in long form TV series and stuff where like a secondary character whether they become just super popular or because the mm. writing staff starts to figure out they're like, oh, we really like writing this character or right. this actor is really compelling or whatever. And I feel like it happens the same way in, in fiction as you go along and you find that like that you've got somebody that like, oh, this story really compels me this, you know, and, and brings new light to things. I like with Taru that that this is a character who has a function, right? Like mm -hmm. they certainly, you know, are slightly out of phase with the rest of society because of their status as undeclared, but they also very much have a job. They take it very seriously. They're very, very good at it. They're extremely competent. Mm -hmm. And the story forces them into 
roles and positions and negotiating, almost being like an ambassador, being a leader, all of these mm -hmm. things that they do not want <laughs> and did not set out to do. And they are absolutely certain they're bad at it. But sometimes somebody has to rise up to the role. Evie is a similar character, mm -hmm. doesn't set out to command a, a rebellion, to, oh, do, to, yeah. to revolutionize the Savage Legion. But, you know, things happen uh, <laughs> when you Stuff put happens. yourself on the line, right? Yeah. But something I did want to kind of touch on, and I'm always interested in, in how this works, because especially in you know the modern age of fiction writing, where we are rightfully being more conditioned to be aware of the types of stories that we tell about people who may not match up with us mm -hmm. um, in a lot of categorical ways. When you were writing two main characters here that are, you know, one is a disabled and one is essentially non-binary. What was like kind of the editorial impact during that, during the creation of those characters and, and as the story went along, did you employ like sensitivity readers or get mm -hmm. feedback from your initial beta readers and stuff like that? Like how did those characters, how were they affected by that? How did they evolve? It's a great question. I, I like talking about this because I'm, very, I'm extremely pro sensitivity editor. To me, it's just a, it's a tool that should be absolutely should be employed. It just makes your work better. And I don't, I, it, baffles me how that's such a controversial thing to so many people. Um, no, I had, so when I, I started out before, for research purposes, I had a disability uh, consultant. I had a disabled author that I talked to. I'm not going to use any names because I don't, I don't like putting that out there because sure. if, any, cause then if, anything, if anybody takes issue with the book, I don't want it to seem like I'm pushing it off onto the sensitivity or like clearly it's their fault. I had them, I don't want to use them as a shield essentially, but I had a disabled author who helped me with that. And then during the editorial process, we actually brought in a sensitivity editor specifically for uh, to Ruth's parts and the nine bi and non-binary content in there. The author is non-binary themselves. And that was because not that I didn't handle the, the role well, but what it, it, the, the interesting thing about it was the sensitivity editor was someone we sent, we sent the book to and they said, I love the, I love the part, but one thing I don't love is the way Matt seems to focus on making them the subject of scorn and ridicule and oppression constantly and that was something i hadn't considered before and this editor was very kind they said i would love to work with him to to rectify those things and i was thrilled to hear that that was something i didn't even realize i was doing and it's just i think it's something we're conditioned especially people who look like me i'm a big you know old white dude we're just kind of conditioned to see marginalized characters through the lens of trauma and nothing else and i was very surprised that, and even being me as someone i try to be very empathetic and aware of these things completely missed me, you know, and that's just because of that conditioning. So I was very fortunate that this author read the book and was willing to help me work on that, which we did. And I was extremely happy with the changes uh, that we made. I think it makes Teru's character better. I think it makes their arc better. And uh, yeah, so I was very, very lucky and very fortunate to work with some very good sensitivity editors that helped me with all the perspectives that are well beyond my own life experience and my own perspective. It's a thing that makes me think about like I've seen lots of conversations before, like amongst like the black community with both like writers and filmmakers and, and the audiences for their work where they yeah. talk about how, hey, we've put a lot of emphasis on black trauma. Can we talk yes. about black joy? Absolutely. And yeah. particularly, I think when we get into fantasy worlds where we can deviate a bit from the structures and, and social political problems of our own world, we can reflect them. But sometimes it's nice to be able to say, OK, we don't have to go as hard on those things so um yeah so yeah i like hearing that and seeing that i agree as far as the sensitivity readers just make things better yeah informing our world in a real way uh informing the stories that we tell and the stories that we consume uh more authentically is is really important to me and i think it only makes things better and i feel like if authors throw up their walls of like well, it's my story and i'll do whatever i want with it right sure yeah you can do that but mm -hmm. you're going to you, your work will be lesser for it it absolutely will. And that's then no one is forcing anyone to use any form of it. It's just so ridiculous. It's like, you know, you'll you'll see an author who they wouldn't have any problem. It's like, oh, I'm gonna write a story about cars, so I better go get an auto mechanic so I don't mess up all the car content. But you tell them, hey, you don't know anything about the background or the ethnicity or the culture of the character you're writing. Maybe you should talk to somebody about that. And you're like, don't censor me. It just that makes <laughs> it makes just on a craft level, like even setting empathy aside, but just on a craft level. 
don't you want your story and your writing to be the best and the most realistic it can be when you're doing stuff like that? It's just so absurd. It's funny how the goalposts move for people yeah, like that. Absolutely. You know, what things that they deem important, like, well, you've got to get this part right, but this over here, who cares, right? Yeah, um, exactly. That's, it's fantasy. <laughs> it's fiction. It's so weird and confounding. You know, I mentioned earlier, well, you mentioned Nava Wolf earlier. Um, right. Again, we mentioned, like, you know, she's this well-known editor in this world, had a big impact on the series early on. Mm -hmm. I do want to just talk about your experience in the editorial, because obviously, I mean, the, the third book is dedicated to Nava. Um, mm -hmm. and you've been vocal online talking about what an impact she, you know, she made on the series and also kind of how, a little bit of how you felt going through the rest of it, like new editorial staff. And, mm -hmm. and, and this is not any critique or shade or commentary on anybody no, no. else involved in the process. But I do want to know f about your experience having that juggle of being like, here was my guiding light, then it had to shift around how that impacted your experience writing it and how it impacted the series entirely. I want to talk about this stuff. This is important stuff. This is the stuff that we don't talk about enough or we don't educate new writers about enough when they get into publishing. You know, we talk endlessly about craft and how to make your book good, but we don't teach them how to deal with uh, really messy, political, harrowing publishing messes when they happen, which is what happened behind the scenes with the series. So yeah, no, Nava is the editor who we, we sub to. Nava's the one who believed in me in the, in the books, is the one who bought the whole series and is the one who edited Savage Legion all the way to the finish line and did a fantastic job. I still think it's the best book in the series and probably the best novel I've written overall to date, to be honest with you, be largely because of her, because she's so, she's so good. She pushes you in all the right and best ways, which is what I think an editor should do. And was just endlessly committed to championing the series too. You know, we were... One of the things that made what I'm about to describe so so difficult is that everything seemed so good when we started. When I signed with Saga, Nava was the senior editor there. She just won a Hugo. She was top of the heap. She loved this book. It presented very well when Saga showed all the new titles. She said uh, we were going to have a lead title with it. It was looking great. So we finished editing the first book. We got ready for it to come out. I wrote the first draft of Savage Bounty, the second book. It was very rough, but hey, I was with Nava, so I wasn't even worried about it. Like, I, like it can be a little rougher than I usually like to show people because she's going to help me fix it. I turned it in, and then a few weeks later, I found out that she was fired, basically, and it was really terrible. Like, there was just there's no way to sugarcoat it. It was devastating to me. It was devastating to me and a lot of other authors that that she had to leave behind. And I'm not going to go into the detail to the circumstances around that. I will 100% say I don't think it was a fair situation. I don't think it was fair to Nava at all. I don't think it was fair to her authors. But that's all I'll say about that aspect of it. The effect it had on me was was really not good. Uh, <laughs> I felt very adrift uh, creatively, and I felt very adrift professionally at that publisher. And it taught me, despite how long I've been doing this, because I'd been relatively fortunate with editors up to that point, it taught me a very important lesson, which is your editor is not only the person who helps you make your book better, helps you make your work better. Your editor is often is your champion at that publisher and is often the only champion that you or your work have at that publisher. You know, I think new authors, you tend to think I sign with a publisher. I'm with the publisher. The whole publisher has my back. They're excited to have me on board. They're working for me. We're a partner. It's all going to be, you know happy letters and, and Cheerios. And hopefully that's the case, man. I want that for every author. Every author should have that. You should have the publisher that signs you behind you 100%. But the truth is how it works is your editor is often the one who is getting you the resources and the attention and the things that you need for your book to be successful at that publisher. And what I quickly found out after Nava departed was she was the only champion that her books had at that place. It's just, it's just the truth. Anything that her authors got, they got them because Nava was there fighting for it 100%, whether it was marketing support, editorial support, publicity support, anything it was. You had that because Nava was there relentlessly at, you know, four foot nine every day, just as tough as can be fighting for it. And she's, she's an amazing person. So me and, and the other authors that she was forced to leave behind, we were kind of adrift, like I said, creatively and emotionally, but we were also sort of left adrift uh, professionally for a long time. My book, the second book in the Savage series sat on a shelf for 14 months uh, before it had any more editorial attention. I've been through two editors since then, and some of them were better than others. Uh, my last editor, Amaro Hoshijo, she was very good. She came in extremely late on the last book. She did her best, but it's a very hard thing to recover from. 
And I'm not saying that you can't shift editors in the middle of the series and still be successful and still write good books and still have a good time of things. Unfortunately, this was just one of those things where when Nava was let go, Saga Press was merged with another imprint within Simon & Schuster. You know, it wasn't just an instance of one editor uh, leaving a, a job. It was an instance of this huge company-wide shakeup, reorganization, and a lot of us just got lost in the shuffle. And, I, you know, I don't think that was... 100% intentionally malicious uh, by the folks in charge. A lot of that is just, we weren't their author. All this stuff happened. They had other stuff to focus on. And I think we did just get lost in the shuffle, like I said, to a certain extent. So I try to have perspective on it. I try not to be bitter about it, but it, it wildly impacted both the writing of the rest of the series for me. Um, and it impacted just the success and the potential of the series commercially. And then, and then a year later, the the pandemic happened. So that was a whole other, uh, that's a lot of, yeah, they both, all of these books have come out in the pandemic years. Savage Legion came out summer of 2020. It was, it was just a perfect storm of awful. You know, there's, there's just no way around it. I found myself at a place when Savage Legion came out of, I have no editorial support. I have no marketing support. And even if I did, we're in a place where my publisher openly admits this pandemic thing. We don't know how to sell books during this thing. We're still trying to figure it out. And, and the thing is, I don't want to lay it off entirely on that. I don't want it to come across like total sour grapes. Like I'm saying, oh, man, if they just got behind the book, we would have had an international bestseller and there'd be a freaking HBO series right now. And I would have been minted. And that's, you know, that's the reason that that it, it performed the way it did. I'm not saying that. I will say I know 100% in my heart we would have done better than we did if all of those things had not happened. My only thing with publishing and the, and really the best you can expect from today's publishing industry, which is deeply flawed on so many levels, is that your book gets the best shot it can get under the circumstances. You know, So if you're a debut author at a mid-range publisher, you just want all the support that they can logically and realistically give you under those circumstances. You know they're not going to spend a fortune promoting your book. You know you're not going to be on billboards. You know you're not going to be in your own case in the front of the bookstore. You know all those things. But you at least want them to get out there and ring a bell a little bit. And that just, that didn't happen for the first two books in the series. And I'm very, I'm very sad about that. I just, it's, I always kind of regret not getting to see what we could have done had Nava remained with the publisher and had the pandemic not happen, which I know is a lot of ifs and a lot of things to change. <laughs> and I certainly don't just want the pandemic to not have happened so my book could have sold more copies. I'm not saying that either, but it was a big deal for me. It was my first, it was my first novel with a major publisher. It was my first novel with a major publisher. It was my debut in this genre, a genre I always wanted to write in. And it was very deeply upsetting and depressing for all of those things to happen and to have to debut the way we debuted. And it was very difficult to recover from that for me as I went forward writing the series. It made me want to give up, to be honest with you. There were plenty of points during that process where I honestly kind of hoped that they would just cancel the thing. I hoped they would just cancel the series, pay me out my contract, and I could just sort of move on uh, with the rest of my life and write something else because I just felt like, well, we're screwed now. There's nothing we can do. I'm very glad that didn't happen. I'm very happy at the end of the day that I got to finish the series. All the books have come out. And I have them on a shelf and I did the thing that I set out to do. So grappling with those feelings was tough, but ultimately I'm glad that we were, I was able to work through them and finish the thing the way we did. And yeah, and the other thing is you give it a long enough lifespan, you never know what happens. So the third book, I've been through, you know, three times as many publicists as I have been editors in this thing because there was so much turnover at Saga while they merged with Gallery, just all of this crap that went on. Um, and again, I'm not even laying blame on a specific person for it. It was just, it was a big, messy shuffle, and I kind of got ground in the wheels of it. But coming into Savage Crowns, we got a new publicist, Cassidy Sattler, and she's been absolutely amazing. She's the reason I'm on this podcast right now talking right. to you. Yep. Exactly. Um, and Cassidy has done, coming into book three of a series like this, that's gone through all the things it has, she has absolutely made a huge difference in how we finish this thing out. And to be perfectly honest with you, I got no place before Cassidy came on with this book where I was like, all I'm looking for is to finish writing this thing and then get the book out. I'm not even going to go out and try to make a big deal out of it. I'm not going to worry about promo or marketing. An author, an author's so, uh, solo efforts on marketing a book are completely negligible to how the book does commercially. It's just the truth. Unless you have a massive pre-existing platform studies scientific studies have been done on this like you just you are virtually incapable of moving the needle either your publisher is going to spend the money to make the book a success it's going to catch on by word of mouth organically on fire that way 
one of those two things is going to happen or it's just nothing you do is going to change the outcome. So I, knowing that I was like, just let the third book come out. Let me hold it in my hands. Let me move on with my career and my writing and my life. And that's fine. And then Cassidy shows up and she's like, no, no, we're not done. We can still make something happen here. So I almost like, I was happy and almost resentful at the same time. I was like, how dare you, Cassidy, come along in the, in the, in the 11th hour and make me care again. But it's been, it's been really great, man. It's just been great to give the series what I feel like has been a proper send off. And Cassidy has allowed me to do that. A good publicist is what allows you to do that. And having that makes all the difference in the world. So it's a story that started out really happily, had its kind of empire strikes back middle act, but we managed to sort of pull it out and, uh, party down with the Ewoks a little bit at the end here. I cannot believe I use that analogy, but I'm a good I host. love it. I right behind my head. No, I'm mean, the listeners. I see, see it. Yeah, yeah. But wicked, there's a right? wicket right behind yes. my head. Yeah. So Absolutely. so yeah. I love a good Ewoks reference. I'm here for that. Awesome. Awesome. And I love a shout out to Cassie. I love shout outs to, to publicists in general. A big oh, part yeah. of why Fictitious exists is because Ellen Wright at Orbit Books mm. introduced me to this world um, when I met her on the convention scene years ago. And uh, a lot of Fictitious turning into something and gaining the connections to talk to people like you started with her. So I am a huge fan of the publicists uh, working in this world because I, they really are unsung champions so much of the time. Oh, absolutely. Like like line editors, like copy editors, like all the, all the, you know, and again, when you first get into this, you don't realize how big the village is that it takes to make a book. You really don't. I always try to make sure that I'm thanking them in the book, that I'm thanking them online, that I know their names. And it just, it just helps, man. Like, cause you, these people are vital to the success of your book. Just from a like a you know a mercenary standpoint, you should want to know them and have a good rapport with them. But yeah, a publicist can 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 make or break things, and it's such a difficult job, man. Like you know, the first publicist I had on the Savage Books was fantastic. She was an amazing person. She was spread so thin and had so few resources, though there was very little she could do. You know, before she eventually left, I remember she was working on graphics to promote the book in her off hours, like when she wasn't even getting paid for it. They're amazing people. And, and a lot of times it's not that they're not doing a good job or not doing their job. They're doing the best with the resources they have. They're just not being given the time or the resources they need or the support they need. It's important to remember that because, you know, it's sort of like we talked about with the book, the bureaucracy. It's like, I can't talk to the CEO of Simon Schuster. And I don't even, I can't even remember who that is off the top of my head. I should know. But like your publicist is right there every day. So it's very easy to start resenting the person who's next to you for how things are going when they're not going well. And you really have to remember that they're having the same problem you have. They're not being given the support and the resources a lot of the time. So, yeah, they're absolute rock stars. It's, a, it's an incredibly difficult, thankless job. And then the people who are really committed to it, like Cassidy does this because she loves books. She loves fiction. Like they love this business and they get exploited for that and taken advantage of. We all do. And it really sucks to see. So. All that is to say, just to echo what you're saying, shout out to publicists and all the unsung heroes who make books happen because they're they're the ones. Something that you talked about on social media well back too that I like, can I, I think I feel like this is kind of a good tie up for for sure. everything we've been talking about. You were at this point as you know this you know third book baby is pushed out into the world, <laughs> and you know there's an excitement of like a trilogy is complete. That is a huge accomplishment mm -hmm. um, for a writer to make this thing a reality, get it out into the world, actually get it into bookstores. Like that's a big exciting. Here it is. My my vision is completed. But it's also scary as hell because it mm. means that the thing you've been working on for years <laughs> is done. And now you have to decide what you're doing next. And some authors, you know, are already you know, you've got things in the queue, depending on how their workload goes or how fast they are. I mean, everybody works differently. Right. For you with the, the trilogy complete. What does that mean? Because like you said, that doesn't necessarily mean that a relationship continues with the publisher you're at. Right. You might be looking at going other places or doing different things. So what does that mean for Matt Wallace in this moment? Trilogy complete, big checklist done. What now? That's, uh, I tell, tell you, if you asked me that question six or seven months ago, I probably would have hated you forever for it. Um, but <laughs> it's an, no, and that's, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And I think it is a good way to kind of bring everything home. So, Late last year, looking towards the release of this book, I did find myself at that, again, I hate the word, but crossroads. Uh, and I started thinking, because all my contracts were coming up. I also write middle grade novels. Mm -hmm. um, and I enjoy doing that very much. I have a new one coming out in October, uh, Nowhere Special. Please go get that. Nowhere Special was the last one I had on that contract as well. So Savage Legion was ending my adult fantasy contract. Uh, Nowhere Special was ending my current middle grade contract. I had nothing contracted after that. It was the first time, I think, since 2000. 15 
that I didn't have a book currently under contract that had a deadline and I knew what my next book coming out was. And it was a very scary place to be. And there was a part of me that after everything I had been through, and I was also having some interesting problems at the time and just my, my career in general. Um, and I also write video games. That is That was going really well at, uh, at the time and still is. I love writing. I love writing video games. But there was a part of me, and I talked a little bit about this on Twitter too, the part of me that realized, look, if I just don't write another book, it's really not going to matter, you know? And it's not, and that's not, and the thing is, I say that and people want to immediately go, no, no, Matt, your work is important. Your contribution is important. It's important for you. I'm not looking for that. I'm really just practically from a standpoint, you just kind of have to realize it's like, if I don't write another book, the industry is going to move on. Other writers are going to move on. Readers are going to move on. I'm not at a place success wise where anybody is going to come looking for my next book that's just the reality of where i'm at right now so if i just stop writing that just kind of be it and, and it wouldn't be a thing and everything would just sort of move on without me and that would be fine maybe i want to do that that's not an unhealthy conversation to have with yourself it's not a sad but you hear that and you think man that's so sad and you got to stick with it and persistence and that all that stuff is very important but there can be such a thing as unhealthy persistence there can be such a thing as getting to a point where you are not getting what you need or what you want from what you're doing and continuing to do it is not good for your mental health or your financial health or anything like so it's not a bad conversation to have and i had that conversation with myself and i asked myself if you just stop writing books what would the impact be on you because that and that's what i'm trying to get to it can't be about anybody else it's not about the industry it's not about a publisher it's not even about readers it's, it's and even, not even saying you haven't touched readers or readers don't care about your stuff. I have plenty of readers who love this series, but it has to ultimately be about what impact is it going to have on you as the author? Because you're the one who wants to write this stuff. Right. And I came to the decision that I wasn't done yet. I hadn't accomplished the things I wanted to accomplish. I had more stories that I wanted to tell in the medium and that um, I needed to, to, to make some proactive choices if I wanted to get to where I wanted to be. And that's that was the second part of the conversation. The first part is, do you want to keep doing this? Okay, you decided you do. How are you going to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish? And I wanted to have more of a plan than just, I just read another book and put it out there and see what happens. Even though that's not a bad thing. Sometimes that's all you can do. Most of the time, that's all you can do. But for me in the specific situation I was in, that meant for me finding a new agent, which I did in February, uh, Becky Lejeune of Bond Literary, who's amazing. We're doing great things together already. And reassessing what are the things you want to accomplish in this business and how are you and your new agent going to go about that? So that's kind of the place I'm at right now. Like I don't, I still don't know what my next book is going to be. I don't have a new deal yet beyond my current contracts, but I have proposals out. I have directions that I'm taking. I know I want to keep writing adult fantasy. I know I want to keep writing middle grade fiction because I find it very rewarding. And I have some other things beyond genre that I might want to do. And I have an agent who is able to help me figure those things out and is very excited about working with me and making that happen. So that's really the place I'm at. I've had kind of a rebuilding year, as they would say in sports terminology. And it's been very exciting. Just last week was a very good week. On Sunday, uh, the video game I've been writing for a long time was finally announced. And they dropped the trailer. Xbox did for their summer showcase. And we had exciting. It's a huge deal. It was. It's the biggest thing I've ever worked on. I'm very excited about that. Savage Crowns came out on Tuesday following that. More coverage than we'd had for, for both of the other two books uh, put together. And it was it was very exciting to see that. And then just doing live events. I got to do a live event with Kate Elliott, who's one of my heroes. You know, oh, I, yeah. you know, just since I was a kid, we're like friends now. It blows my mind. I literally, we did an event for Copper Dog Books. It's a great uh, bookshop. Uh, we did a virtual event. And I told her flat out, like, I don't need to accomplish anything as an author after this. I did an, I did an author event <laughs> with Kate Elliott. Kate Elliott called me one of her peers. Like, I'm done. That's how big a deal that was to I me. I mean, so, you can put that on the wall. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. It's a really big deal for me. Like, I was I was a kid finding one of her books in Half Price Books in Dallas, Texas, and I've just been reading it forever, and she's amazing. She should be as big as George R. R. Martin, in my opinion. She's that, she's that good and that important to the genre. But I did that right after, and just – so, yeah, and then – uh, my agent and I, we we did some stuff I can't talk about yet, but there there will be more exciting news to come. Like things are happening. That was the week I've been building to this whole year, and it was nice. It was it, it made me feel like what I'm doing is working. So that was a very long answer to say it's been a rebuilding year for me, and it's going well, and that's where I'm at. Well, that I love to hear. I love to hear that the ball is rolling steadily and, you know, becoming the avalanche coming down a mountain here. I also love hearing that you write middle grade. I really like when authors moonlight between adult and middle grade stuff, because I think that it's an overlooked section of fiction that obviously the Harry Potters of the world and stuff have been big, um, uh, you know, in that zone. But like there's so much 
great storytelling happening in middle grade that is obviously appropriate for the audience uh you know its intended audience mm -hmm. but that adults can get a lot of enjoyment out of because there's a lot of really compelling things about that world there's a lot of middle grade on my shelf because of that that reason uh so i think that's exciting and if you get a new series coming out that's in that sci-fi fantasy realm in middle grade let's talk again because i would oh, love yeah. to hear i'd love Absolutely. to hear all about it Matt, this has been terrific. I really think that both learning about your career and the highs and lows of it is super educational. I really hope people that uh, that you know are listening to this and hearing about your stuff for the first time are going to go out and grab a hold of this series. I think especially because now that it's complete and it's out there, there are some audiences that wait until something is done mm -hmm. um, before they jump in. Uh, that's not great for the uh, for the <laughs> well being of the author or the publishing world, but I understand it from from a reader's standpoint because some things right. do appear and fizzle out for a lot of reasons not the smallest of them is is you know sort of bureaucratic um mm -hmm. juggling acts that happen like what you talked about so as we finish up can you tell people where they should be following you online so they can keep up with your stuff we've talked about the fact that you you know you've you have a strong social media right. presence but where are those places where should people be keeping up with you sure so uh, my website matt-wallace.com i uh, try to keep it very up to date with everything i'm doing because i live in fear of dolly adler telling me that it's up it's not up to date um <laughs> we should all fear that and rightfully so i'm still clinging to twitter and it's dying throes uh just because i'm a creature of habit but I'm you're not brave wrong. i know right i just can't i can't put it i don't know why um i'm exploring other things but yeah so twitter matt f and wallace uh the same thing on instagram which i'm trying to keep that more up to date just to kind of have an alternate, but those are all the main places you can find me. I um, am blessed to do my own podcast with my my longtime friend and co-host, Mer Lafferty. Uh, it's called Ditch Diggers. We talk about all, all a lot of things we talked about here today. We talk about, we focus on the business of being a freelance writer of every stripe. Uh, we have really good guests on it. Uh, you can go to merverse.com, Mer's website, to learn all about that. Uh, we live stream on Twitch uh, when we record podcasts. Uh, with an audience, it's a good time. It's always a fun thing. I encourage everybody to come out. And uh, yeah, find me on all of those places. Well, I'll have links to all that on the blog associated with this, on the YouTube page, in the show notes, all the places where people can find them. Um, hope people check it out. Again, uh, Savage Crowns, the third book in the series, uh, in the Savage Rebellion series, is out now. So all three books are on the shelves, uh, in ebook, in all, you know, in all the places. So people should definitely check them out. And Matt, thank you for joining me on Fictitious. Oh, man, I like I, I am honored to have been uh, your comeback episode, man. This has been a fantastic conversation, a fantastic experience. Thank you so much. Big thanks go out to Cassidy Sattler at Saga Press for setting up this interview. Links to buy all of the books in Matt Wallace's Savage Rebellion trilogy are in the show notes. I use affiliate links, so purchasing through those supports my work on this program. But I always encourage you to shop your local indie bookstores whenever possible. Fictitious is available on all the major podcasting platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Google Podcasts, Audible, and Amazon. If you're listening on a platform that allows you to like and subscribe, please do so and leave me a comment about the episode, or consider leaving a review and a starred rating. I love getting your feedback, and all of that helps the show to grow and find more listeners. Fictitious is most active on Instagram these days under the handle fictitiouspod, and all of my interviews are available at fictitiouspodcast.com. I'm Adrian Buskey, and it's good to be back with you. Thanks for listening to Fictitious. Fictitious.